This is really my favorite time of the week. Ah. Yeah, I Good do morning. enjoy watching people do this. Too. <laughs> yeah. That was my bad. I got excited and said it's my favorite time of the week, which it is. Hello, hacksters. Welcome to Hackster Cafe every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific. Today we're talking to Ahmed Oyun Oyun <laughs> Oyunaga. Yeah, Oyunaga. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, who is a very prolific creator of tools for hardware makers. So you create electronics that help people create electronics. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty much right. Love it. Um, could you tell us about some of your most recent projects? Um, well, my my most recent projects have been um, the Amsville dial and then the pick and place wheel. So um, I think I released the Amsville dial last year and then the pick and place wheel followed um, um, a few months after. And then recently I just um, upgraded the pick and place wheel to um, to a larger, a larger wheel size. So um, mm. a bigger wheel with um, a lot more slots, yeah. Could you tell us about the pick and place wheel? What is this? What does it do? Well, um, okay. So I, I guess I guess it, um, it, it all goes back to say 2020. That was during the pandemic. So that was when I started development on the Amsville dial. Uh, now I knew I was going to sell eventually sell um, the dial, but and there there are a lot of um, there are lots of PCBs I will have I will have to make you know in order to in order to sell the PC in order to sell the um the dial ball. Um, I make I make all my PCBs by hand. Everything. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So I don't have any fancy tools here. So I knew it was going to be difficult to, um, you know, to make so many PCBs, um, by hand. And if I um, I'm sure you've seen this board. Oh um, yes. So um, all the boards you find here, these are the boards. Uh, all go into the into the dial. So I have to and assemble all these boards. So um, with that in mind, I knew um, you know the way I used to assemble my um, um, small batch of prototypes was not going to was not going to cut it. So um, um, I knew I had to come up with something that would help the process. That would help the process, you know, be um, a bit faster. So that was when I started. Uh, that was when I got the idea for the pick and place wheel. So. Um, Luckily, um, sometime around, um, I think early last year also, um, unexpected maker, that's Sion, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name properly. Oh, unexpected yeah. maker also released um, his own pick and place um, turntable. That was before I even started design on my on my wheel. So for me, it was still just conceptual. I was just, I had just released the Amsville dial. So I had not started de um, designing the pick and place wheel yet. All I knew was um, I knew it was going to be um, electronic, not just you know um, a passive pick and place wheel like um, like he uses. So um, I guess that's where. Um, so uh, sorry, so I'm going going back to um, his video. So when I saw his video, um, a lot of the um, little bits that were not yet in place for the design of the pick and place wheel. So it, it, it all it all just um, it all just clicked for me. So. Um, I credit a lot of the inspiration for the for the wheel design to um, to see on from unexpected maker. So he inspired um, he inspired um, the design of the of the wheel itself. But essentially, what the pick and place wheel um, system is is I looked at the way I used to um, populate my PCBs, why I used to make my PCBs. I looked at all the individual processes that were involved in doing that. So I wanted to come up with a system that would. Um, Sort of integrate all this, um, all these processes into something that was streamlined and something I didn't have to think about too much. Um, you know, when you're placing PCBs, especially PCBs with really small um, SMB components, um, you tend to worry about you know misplacing um, components and then um, or, or maybe just um, um, placing components with different values on on the different slots because um, you can't really tell, especially. For my PCBs, I don't like to have the designators on the PCBs because I don't think it looks um, as good. Uh, the the aesthetic the, choice. Yeah, 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 aesthetic choice. So, um, so I just wanted to um, kind of make all those processes um, into one single process that makes um, my entire process easy. So that was where um, that's where the pick and place. Way. So if, yeah, if, yeah, if you take a look at the picture, you just scroll by. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so if you take a look at this picture, this is essentially what um, my process used to be like. So I would have a pile of um, yeah. all these um, components, um, a much larger pile than this. This was this was just for 
um, the purpose of this demonstration, but a much larger pile than this, and then I'll have it on one side, and I'll pick the I'll pick out um, a component from the pile, um, take a look at the um, the the, this, um, the spreadsheet that contains the designator, and just um, if you if you have information about the the component I pick up, and then I look I look at the board I look at the board on my system, mm -hmm. and then I locate where it's supposed to go on the PCB. So that's that's how I used to how I used to um, make my PCBs. But if you if you take a look at this, is not efficient at all. Mm. So yeah, it's not, um, and it's something I have to be very conscious of because um, although having the pile having the pile to one side and then moving moving them component by component to a placed pile was um, helped me avoid errors. But so it's mm -hmm. not an efficient process. So that's when. Um, that, that was essentially what um, the pick and place wheel helps me helps me solve. So I integrated all the processes that you see in this um, all the processes um, indicated in this um, image, and I integrated mm -hmm. into um, into the pick and place wheel system. So, so um, okay, yeah, uh, go ahead. You want to ask a question? I'm really curious. Just uh, you were probably about to say this, but like how it works exactly? Like how does it yeah, know yeah. which one to? Okay, so um, so the, the, the way I saw it was, um, um, so pretty PCB, too. yeah, thank you. <laughs> PCB fab houses, you know, um, all you really need to give them is your Gerber files for your PCB your, and your pick and place with, and, and your pick and place file. So the mm -hmm. pick and place with, um, pick, pick and place um, file contains all the information about the components that go on the PCB. So I figured, why not just use the same pick and place with file that you huh. normally generate for, you know. Um, for a professional manufacturing job, and then use that to, you know, tell exactly where each component on that particular board is supposed to go. So, um, for me, I just I, I thought of it this way. So, what I want to know is I want to know what component I want to place, and then I want to know where on the board I, I need to place it, mm -hmm. as um as well as maybe the value and um whatever other information I need for, for the sake of reference. So, um. I took the pick. I took the um, um, the pick and place wheel file, which which contains the x y um, coordinates on the board for for each component, and then I just I wrote um, um, the pick and place wheel app. That's the application that goes along with the wheel, and that reads that reads that CSV file. It reads the x and y coordinates. Essentially, it reads all the information about um, all the components on the board. So it immediately you load um, the files into the app. It immediately knows everything about um, a particular PCB. So the the other half of the process is um, is is the board image. So mm -hmm. for this, yeah, you don't for this you don't really need um, anything fancy. You can take a picture of um, a PCB of your PC or the PCB you want to place. You can take a picture of a PCB and then just crop it to the board edges. So it's so it's an so it's like. Um, an aspect ratio match for the actual size of the PCB. So it doesn't, the, the image doesn't have to be like um, an exact size match for for the actual board, you know, because you can have very tiny boards and an image of a very tiny board might right. be too small. So yeah, so if you, um, you can scale it up or scale it down as much as you want. Just make sure it's the same aspect ratio, which means yeah, if you multiply it, you get the same um, length and width. So, by doing that, I was able to write um, a little bit of code that just tell, I just um, figures out the size of the image, compares that to the size of the screen, or sorry, the size of the area on the screen where where I dedicated to to show the PCB, and then um, once it compares it, calculates the um, the scaling factor, and then it can match all the it can match all the positions on the all the positions from the CSV file, and then use that to generate pointers on the image to tell you exactly where each component goes. So um, as you select um, different components from the list that uh, is automatically generated whenever you load the files, um, you, you notice that you, you find pointers on the on the PCB image that you use. So there are so many ways you can um, generate the PCB image. You can, like I said, you can take a picture. You can even use um, a, an image like something you, you see on the screen Mm -hmm. So something like anything that anything that is um, adequate enough to tell you exactly where components go on the PCB is fine. So you can you can take the um, the fiscal board itself and then scan it on on a desktop scanner. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, and and that way you can get a pretty um, high resolution image. I usually take a screenshot of 
um, of the PCBs from the design software I use. So yeah, like a peer yeah. you. Yeah. In your example. Yeah. This so is a really um, good walkthrough, by the way. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it was you know, um, it's um, the pick and place is supposed to be um, or the way I designed is supposed to be integral to my making process. So I had to make sure if I was going to get it out there, I had to make sure everything was clear. There was a step by step guide. So you don't because um, it's important. Like I said. Um, it's, it can be frustrating to misplace a component and then try to debug your board um, <sighs> later on. So, yeah, so it's important. It was it was really important to make sure um, I got everything correct, especially when it comes to um, where where the pick and place tells you to place the component. So that's an algorithm I um, I really spent a lot of time on to make sure it was um, it was working perfectly. And this is amazing, uh, the fact that you have this this whole system set up. So it's a, it's not, so it's multiple things. You've got every part of, I don't know, multiple really intense parts of what I feel like are the skills required to do, do this as a complete professional. You've got like your own custom PCB as part of the board. You've got really advanced 3D printing as part of the board, uh, as part of the project. And then it has its own companion app. Like every, you're, you've got every part of the, uh, I feel like each of these things on its own is very challenging for people to learn on this level, and you've just mastered all of them. It's incredible. Yeah, um, I mean, I mean, I wouldn't say mastered, but um, <laughs> I, I've definitely taken my time to, you know, um, to to develop my skills. And if people are excited about this, they can get it on Tindy, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I recently released the um, Pick and Place Wheel XL. That's the larger Pick and Place Wheel. So. Um, one of the, one of the um, things I liked about the pick and place is like it's very customizable. So um, I tend to place very small PCBs. So PCBs are um, usually fit between um, say seventy by seventy um, millimeters. Mm, sorry. Uh -huh. oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, so PCBs are fit between um, seventy by seventy um, millimeters. So. Um, but if you want, if you have larger PCBs, then you have. Um, I'm sure. I'm sorry. If you go back to the um, to the Axta page, um, sure. yeah, there is there's an image I shared where um, I just suggested a few of the configurations that you can have the wheel in Ooh, for different yeah. project types. Yeah, I think I saw that up here, um, where there's like different. This is. I love that there's so many photos in here, and it's really easy to follow. Um, yeah, I try. And you have these beautiful animations about how everything goes together. Yeah. Ugh. Sorry. I, I do. I do one. enjoy making and make. Yeah. Yeah. This one. So um, you, you can see it's very um, easy to customize um, um, with, um, with reference to whichever project type you um, you have. So I have just a little bit of notes that says what um, personally I would use that particular configuration for. Mm. So um, so that's just um, one of the things I um, I enjoyed implementing in the pick and place to make sure it was. Um, it was for everybody, um, so to speak. And it's totally modular. Yeah. So the larger version, I think on the Tindy page, it kind of compares the two. Is this the... the yeah, yeah. So one? that's the size. Yeah, that's the size comparison between the two. Um, but functionally, they're exactly the same mm -hmm. um, down to the electronics. So um, I can show you the difference between the PCBs. Ooh. Yeah. So, um, so you can see the PCB for... Um, for the smaller one and for the larger one, it's exactly the same. Exactly the same circuitry. Um, the long, um, the larger uh, pick and place wheel is just um, a bit longer. Mm -hmm. So um, typically, um, when you want to make either of the wheels, you consider um, the three D printer size that you have. So um, I developed the, um, the larger pick and place wheel XL for large format three D printers. That's something with the best size of at least three hundred by three hundred. And then if you have a standard size um, 3D printer, anything that can undo 200 by 200, then you can make the um, the original pick and place wheel. But functionally, they're exactly the same. But design-wise, though, um, I mean, I, I did make some changes to the new larger pick and place wheel because, um, you know, getting the original pick and place wheel to be as small as it was, to be printable on a, to, to be printable on a standard sized um, 3D printer and to also include two wheels because I wanted to have as much um, wheel slots as possible, mm. so um, I had to I had to do I had to make some compromises. But those compromises are not present in the larger um, 
the larger pick and place well. Ooh, so, what kind of, yeah, what kind of compromises? What you, okay, you yeah. Um, for example, so if I, sorry, I'm trying to. Okay, yeah. So this is. Um, yes. So this is wheel two from the um, original pick and place wheel, and then this is wheel two from the oh. original um, from the new larger pick and place wheel XL. Um, quite a bit of size difference, but that, that's besides the point. Now, if you take a look at the back, um, you can see where the magnets are placed for um, for the original pick and place wheel, and that mm -hmm. goes directly under um, some of the slots. Right. Yeah, so I have to do that because um, there was not enough space to, you know, to move the magnets um, away from mm. away from the slot. So that's one of the compromises I have to make, um, and that compromise applies to just wheel two. Because um, if you take a look at wheel one, you can see the magnets are separate from where the from where the slots are. Right. Yeah, so the, so they don't affect the components. But on wheel two, um, I have to be more selective of the components I place in. I see. Yeah, in, in wheel two. But um, for the new larger pick and place wheel XL, that's not the case anymore. You can see, um, for one, there is um, actually no magnet here. There's an additional piece you need to 3D print that mm -hmm. goes around here where you have the magnets, um, where you have the encoding magnets in. And then you can see that's um, significantly far away from, from the slot. So you don't have any um, magnetization of the components from the new larger pick and place wheel XL. Ah. And there's also some really cool mechanical features here. So first up, there's this, you've designed this PCB so that it slots in with these flexures on the main board, uh, yeah, which I yeah. think is really cool. How, yeah, the how reason I did that, for, yeah, the reason I did that was, um, you know, like I said, the wheel can be customized in whichever way you see fit. So, um, and if you make a lot of PCBs, um, um, I just imagined um, someone that makes a lot of PCB might want to make more than one of these wheels. So instead of having um, one board for for each wheel you make, you can just have just one board and then make as many wheels as you want. And then because the, the same wheel, regardless of the configuration you have, the same board will work for all the configuration. So you can easily remove it. That's and that's why um, I had the it's a it's a flex um, tab mechanism there. So cool. And there's another cool mechanical feature of the pick and place wheel, which is that you can twist it to lock it so that yeah, you don't yeah, have yeah. to. Yeah, can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, I mean, let me get out my uh, my current pick and place wheel. Yeah. Um, I mean, I recently um, released a video where I um, migrated from the wheel you're looking at currently to um, this new, um, the larger one. So mm. I migrated my components over and there's a video about that. So um, if you this, take a look at this whole YouTube channel. Oh yeah. Yeah. So um, I think that's my, that's the um, second to the last video, I think. So if you take a look at the wheel now, it's locked. I don't want to bend it so much because I don't have it properly sealed. So you can see it's locked. Um, so I can just move this, um, this top cover and it snaps into ah. place. You can hear the snap. So it snaps. Once it snaps, it raises the the top cover for both wheel one and wheel two, um, about a millimeter above um, above the wheels. So that allows the wheel to spin freely while you're um, placing the PCBs. And then when you need to um, store the board away, and when you need to store the wheel away, you can just switch to um, to lock it back in place. And that mechanism um, works a lot for. I mean, it works really well for components as small as let's say. 0603 um, capacitors because those are wow. um, yeah a bit thicker. But um, I, in my wheel, I have 0402 um, um, components there, so I tend to use um, um, this flexible seal that I also oh. designed. Yeah, so this wow. this is designed to be 3D printed with CPU. Huh. So um, so if you have really tiny components like I mm. do on my wheel, um, I tend to use um, this to. To you know, to fully seal it when I need to um, maybe move it around or something. So I just made sure I covered um, all the possible scenarios that could you know that could come up. Um, the um, if you use the, um, the the flexible seals, you can actually throw the wheel into like a backpack or something, huh. and all your components will stay in, will stay in, will stay in place. This is so cool. This is so cool. And uh, I wanted to point out that you do, like you mentioned, have this whole. Uh, YouTube channel where you go in depth on some of these projects and some of these are embedded into the tutorials that you've shared as well but like yeah yeah you were mentioning that this is the the second to last one 
where you're talking yeah, yeah. about um, the twist lock mechanism, things like that. And oh, yeah, and I mean, you find most of the details about the pick and place wheel from the original video. That's um, the the first video I made about the pick and place wheel, and then uh, the yeah, and then the second video. Oh no, this yeah. is the this is I found the um, yeah, this is the one, but yeah, this also is have the, the one of the. Yeah, so this is the original um the original video i made so um this video contains a lot of the details so um okay, if you're so not really into reading uh, maybe you don't want to go through reading the axta article then i'm afraid it will um, give us some ads <laughs> yeah the video also contains everything you need to you need to know awesome uh and yeah you can find that <laughs> on Ahmed's YouTube channel, which is linked in the description below, along with uh, several of these tutorials. You get close-ups on, look how tiny that is! And you can, uh, like you said... Yeah, like, yeah, I was actually, um, I was doing a test, so um, I locked the wheel and then I shook it. <laughs> just to just to make sure it doesn't fall off. Wow, nice. Uh, you also have shared a bunch of really cool photos of these projects, like this, I wish I'd seen this photo before it's just beautiful that be oh so yeah it's just, it's just oh. um an image of all the components i currently have in my wheel yeah just it's just gorgeous ah oh, thank I you love that you do the multiple color printing for the different parts and stuff but then you also have shared uh this robot hand you made i hadn't seen this before can you tell us about it yeah i mean um and it's on i mean uh, i started i started my youtube channel i think um um maybe say four say four years ago i'm not sure um essentially um i've been making um or at least i've been um i've been into engineering for a very long time for as long as i can remember so well one thing i've always been bad at is um is sharing maybe taking is is, uh, is i'll say documentation sorry mm. i've always bought well, um this was this were some of the 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 projects that i i built in the past that you know that i did maybe document a little bit of so this was um this was um, a project I built um, in my final year in the university. So um, it was a robotic ham that was, um, it had like, I think, yeah, I think um, I have about 16, I think 17 degrees of freedom. So wow. um, you can move individual um, individual sections of the fingers and then you can you can move the wrist also. And then I think it, um, it, it gets, um, I mean, it's, it, it grows longer and shorter. So essentially I meant for it to be like um, like an assistive robot, maybe to hold something while I was working on other projects or something, and it was kind of like my second um, introduction into um, into into robotics, which I which I really enjoy. Although I've not gotten to um, to do that a lot um, recently, so um, that was what the project was based on, and um, it was driven by air muscles. I'm not sure you know. Um, do you know what air muscles are? Like uh, pneumatic muscles. Yeah, yeah, pneumatic, um, pneumatic muscles. Yeah, so um, I used um, a compressor as um, a compressor I salvaged from um, from a refrigerator. So I used that to power the. So you can see uh, on the wrist there, you can see where the air muscles connect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have um, the air muscles. You the way you make an air muscle is um, with a braided um, mesh sleeve, and then you have um, a flexible something that can expand, like a um, like a silicone tube in between. And then you you seal that on um, on one side, and then you pass air into one side, and then the air muscle can contract and um, wow. and, and relax. And that's how I moved um, the individual sections of the finger as well as the, the wrist itself. So that's ah. so one of the yeah, that's one of the projects. Although um, I didn't I didn't I didn't finish it because um, like I said it was my second introduction to to robotics, and I was in I was I was in over my head. And um, I, a lot of components that I needed to finish it, I couldn't actually get at the time. So, yeah, but it was, it was a fun, it was a fun project to build. And you can see all the individual um, muscles that controlled um, yeah. sections of the fingers. And I went from a wooden, um, from a wooden hand to um, this plastic. So yeah, to to something made of acrylic and then foam on the other side. Yeah, nowadays there's this thing, uh, was it programmable air uh, that is designed to work directly with Arduino and stuff. And I've seen them use it with little uh, expanding sacks, but never this, I hadn't seen this uh, system you're describing with the tube inside of the flexible mesh and, and the way that uh, it's closed. I wanna, that's so cool. Oh, yeah, thank you. It makes me want to delve into this whole extra 
whole other side of uh, robotics. And then you've got this robotic claw here. Yeah, I mean, um, this was, um, uh, like I said, um, the, um, the, the one you just took, took a look at was uh, my second introduction to robotics, and this, this was my first. So mm. again, um, all my projects, um, even up until now, are very Aki. So, and this is about as Aki as it gets. <laughs> so um, if you take a close look, I mean, if, if I start to mention um, all the things that were used in this, um, in this project, um, uh, you, you, you would almost not believe me. Uh -huh. But um, essentially, what what this was meant to be was um, like a robot that could transform from a tricopter into um, yeah, so into um, into a mobile uh, into a mobile um, robot also. So it had a claw on um, on top of it, and then it could move, as you can see from the tires. And then um, I'm not sure it's clear in the picture, but there are um, I made a, I made I made a wing from like aluminium tubes. Like square aluminium tubes, uh, that when you activate them, then they actuate um, and then form a triangle with the one at the back. So huh. again, this is also something I didn't um, I didn't get to finish because, like I said, my first introduction and I was uh, weighing over my head and I couldn't get all of the parts required to 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 finish it. And even just taking a look at um, the project. Um, <laughs> I wasn't, um, as, as in, in retrospect, I wasn't, ex um, I don't know how I, how I ever expected to, to actually fly, but I did get it to move and it taught me a lot about, um, a lot about robotics, so. That's super cool. Um, and then you came up with the, we have, we, you mentioned the Almswell dial at the beginning and Almswell, of course, is your, uh, the name that you go under for YouTube and yeah. for your, uh, social medias. Um, but yeah, can you? Can we talk a little bit more about this? Because it's got so much going on here. And uh, this V2 is just, uh, it looks so cool. And we have to talk about it. So let's start Thank with you. this one. Uh, what are all the different features? It's got touch. It's got rotation. It's got yeah, OK. So um, uh, what you're looking at is the first um, version of the um, of the Amsterdam dial. So um, this was, I was still very, I was still very much limited um as to you know what i had access access to and what i could do so um this was my it was the first and essentially um i saw um, i'm sure you i'm sure you know of the um, microsoft surface dial mm. so uh, yeah so um i saw the device and immediately i just wanted one yeah um i think a lot of <laughs> yeah, people so, had that reaction <laughs> yeah so i just i just wanted one but uh, like a lot of people i couldn't afford it but you know like mm -hmm. um like a lot of I'm lucky to be um a maker with um fairly decent skills so I figured why not build mine so um at the time I just had um all um, linear all effect sensors on hand and then I had a couple of neodymium magnets so mm -hmm. uh so uh, yeah so I, I I mean I just got to thinking I mean I should be able to um to develop a rotary encoder that I could use to build you know something like um something like the surface dial. And then it started with, um, it started with this. Ooh. Yeah, and I shared a video about this. That was when I was actually working on it. So I can honestly say this is, um, um, this is the beginnings of the Armsville dial. So I have two linear all effect sensors there. And then I have alternating poles um, of new demon magnets on the, um, on the rotating knob. So, um, so I used um, the linear all effect sensor and then the and, and the and the neodymium and magnets to develop the um, rotary encoder and then I researched a bit into capacitive touch and I found a couple of libraries I, mean, I found a library sorry that works with Arduino mm. so um, yeah so I combined the rotary encoder and then the capacitive touch so that's all the first version could do it had rotary encoder and it had capacitive mm. touch. So um, what I did for the capacitive touch was I extended the library that I got. The library was just for you know reading the actual um, touch. So I extended mm -hmm. the library to be able to um, do single tap, double tap, short press, and then long press. Oh wow! So yeah, so um, essentially I was just trying to you know um, just trying to give um, Dell as much um, controls as I possibly could. So I think that was the first version. It was just a rotary encoder and then the capacitive touch. So. Um, like most of my projects, um, um, I, I I use them when I when I make them. I actually use them. I don't just um, keep them to the side. Like you like you mentioned earlier in the video, there are, there are tools, so um, I tend to use them. So from time as in, as time um, went by, I you know 
I started to want more for, you know, for the data. I wanted, I wanted to do more with it. So that was when I started um, forming the ideas for the Amsu DAO um, version two. So essentially, I just um, I just wanted to um, add as much as as much um, you know external control as I could possibly integrate into one device. And mm. yeah, and, and that's what the um, the Amsu DAO is. So um, um, essentially, regardless of what you do, I mean, you can find you can find you can find a use um, in the um, in the in the Amsterdam DAO V2. So um, it's kind of like for <laughs> I wouldn't say for everybody, but um, yeah, um, there's usually, always different variants. Yeah, 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 here. yeah. There are different variants, so you can. There's always something for um, depending on what you do. You can always um, go for um, any of the versions. So. And I, I, I think I did uh, most of development for for this during the pandemic. So that was mm. how I, uh, yeah, that was um, uh, what took most of my time during that period. Yeah. So what's the difference between the small ones and the tall ones here with the dials? Yeah. Now, now the tall ones, the the major difference between the tall ones is the space now. So um, I just took this apart. This is my Ooh. personal dial. So you can see. The, the tall ones have this space oh. mechanism, yeah. So that's the that's the main difference between wow. um, the the, um, the taller ones. And you've got personalized icons on your keyboard there. What are those ones? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're making me you're making me go a little bit nerdy. But, oh, absolutely. Um, that's, um, we can't yeah, stop looking at this. Yeah. So that's um, the Justice League um, ah, logos. That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so um okay. I'm sure um I'm sure some people that watch um some of my videos would would not find that surprising. I yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of um uh, Justice League. Awesome. Yeah, and again, uh if people you want to watch the videos, there's um all these videos on Ahmed's channel. Yeah. Um including like really in-depth stuff about so this is the V1. Yeah, yeah. You're talking about. And how did the dial itself change between? Is the central dial part here the same between V1 and V2? And you just added more stuff, or did you also make updates to the central? Uh, oh, um, um, there's there's a lot of updates to. Um, mm. I mean, uh, I mean, um, uh, I mean, we can get a bit technical. Anyways, um, the first yes, version please. of the yeah, the first version of the um of the dial, I used um, um, just analog um encoding, which means. The, the Arduino that was running the first version of the dial had to do, um, um, I mean, essentially the encoding was done with analog readings from the all effect sensors. Now mm. in the new version, in the new version, I developed three new um, rotary encoding, um, how do I put it, um, rotary encoding um, methods or functions. Let me just put it functions. Mm -hmm. So um, essentially the, the first version could just do, you know, step-by-step -step rotation. But um, the new, um, but the new encoders on the new um, on the new dials, they use interrupt interrupt based um, detection. So they're, they're, um, they're faster, considering they have to do um, they have to undo a lot of um, other controls on the on the dial. So um, one of the things you can do, one of the types of um, encoding that you can do is, um, aside from the step by step encoding, you can do continuous rotary encoding. That's um, um, you know, um, the, the way the encoder works is you have alternating poles on on the on the on the ring of magnets. Okay. So what I did was I interpolated between um, each magnet. So if, if you um, if you if you think about it, um, the analog reading from from magnet to magnet would be about say 500 on a 10 bit um, encoder, and then you multiply that by the resolution by the um, by the base res base resolution for um, for the encoder, and then you get a much um, larger, uh, or you get higher resolution. So I call that mm. um, extended resolution. So you can do that on the new, um, on the new dial, and then you can also do um, acceleration-based um, um, rotary encoding, oh, which yeah. means, yeah, depending on how fast you move, um, how fast you move the dial, then the dial responds. Um, it gives you. Um, incremental values that represents how fast you're moving the dial and i think i have a video talking about this as well Ooh, i'll have to yeah. go and check that out because it's really interesting and you know i've seen people do sort of a kind of fake rotary encoding by using uh potentiometer but this rotates freely so it has to be able to go 
Oh yeah, 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 yeah. When I when I was developing the um, rotary encoder, you know, I wanted something that was um, that was very versatile, which means I can fit it into anything. So um, it's the same rotary encoder that's on the that's on the pick and place wheel. So um, it's I just wanted it to be versatile, so we, um, I couldn't use um, a rotary encoder because that was um, um, normally when you use. I'm sorry, I couldn't use a potentiometer. Sorry, because yeah. when you use a potentiometer, um, you can rotate it as freely as you can. Um, um, the magnetic rotary encoder, and it's not continuous too, so you can't like you can't do 360 um, in one direction. So um, I just I just wanted to make sure it was something that you know, that was not um, dependent that was not dependent on um, how physically sturdy it was built. So mm -hmm. um, since there are no since there's no contact between the moving part and then the and then the sensing um, electronics, so um, um, the rotary encoder it's it's very it's, it's very difficult to damage. Um, that's the way to put it. Nice. So yeah, very and it's very versatile and very difficult to damage. So that was that was like my main, I mean, goal because I knew if I was going to make a device that you know had to be um, rotated a couple um, a lot of times, so um, it had to be it has to be robust regardless of if it was 3D printed or not. Cool. I'm really curious. Also, uh, so you said that we went to university, and I'm curious what type of uh, I'm assuming it was some type of engineering um, based on what you said. But uh, you've got so many aspects here, including like mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and different types of things. I'm curious which one of those was your focus. Okay, um, electric, electrical engineering. I graduated, I graduated ah, cool. with um, electrical engineering, yeah. Because then you have this like custom parametric 3D printed steel ball bearing, and that's its whole own like. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> um, as I mentioned earlier, um, um, I, I tend to be a bit, um, a bit hacky about the things I make because. Um, one thing that is a bit difficult for me here in Nigeria is um, access to things. So um, if I can make it, then I, then I will, um, as opposed to um, as opposed to buying it. So that's that's where the the bearing came from. I knew I was going to be using a lot of bearing in my um, in in coming uh, projects. So I decided to um, you know develop something I could just 3D print and then just make. And I've gotten that design to. Um, so, like I said, um, in all my devices, you find all my bearings are 3D printed. So, um, awesome. Yeah. Now, uh, you've been selling multiple products on Tindy for a while. Let's take a look yeah. at those. Um, Almsville Labs, you've got your pick and place wheel, your high resolution magnetic rotary encoder, which people can buy yeah. on its own. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And the different variants of the Almsville dial. What have you learned from running your own business in this way? Like, what are the, yeah. I mean, I mean, um, okay, I think the first thing I can say is um, shipping sucks. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, standard um, standard shipping sucks. Um, um, it's very, um, especially when, when it comes to um, um, countries that don't have direct transit from from a country like Nigeria, so um, it's it's very shipping is very difficult because uh, um, it takes it takes too long and um, that, and that time was exaggerated during the um, during the pandemic. So um, a lot of what I've had to do recently is when people um, place an order, I have to um, give them the option to upgrade the shipping to um, something faster like DHL or FedEx. So mm -hmm. and that way I can get the I, I can get the items to them as quickly as possible. But um, Aside from you know having to deal with the um, um, challenges of shipping, I mean, I guess, um, I guess what, what I've learned is you know um, you should, I guess you should just always try to be you know honest and upfront with you know with yeah. what you're doing. Yeah, I think I think that's um, I think that would be my um, biggest um, takeaway from you know selling products of mine. So just try to be as honest as possible. Mm. That makes sense. And uh, what was it like getting started on Tindy? I mean, I just, um, I mean, I watched other YouTubers that did the same, and that's how I um, came across Tindy. But mm. um, it was pretty straightforward, surprisingly so, because um, things like this are usually not um, straightforward for um, for for the country I'm from. So, um, but it was pretty straightforward. I just signed up, and then I listed my first product, which was the original version of the that's the first version of the of the Amsterdam dial the and same. then I was still I was still learning like two bad pictures of the product well mm -hmm. but, um a few people still saw the value in the um in the device and I do appreciate those people. It's out of stock. 
Yeah, no, I mean, um, and I, this is obsolete now, so I don't know, it's so long yeah. ago. I mean, yeah. but it means that <laughs> obviously people enjoyed it. Um, yeah, and what's the most recent one? Oh, well, I mean, um, yeah, the XL will be the most recent one. And what's, yeah, so you mentioned uh, taking better photos. What else have you improved in your process here? What makes it easier for you to run your business? I mean, um, uh, yeah, I mean, um, I guess the, um, the part of part of the difficult part of you know um, making boards like this and make, making and selling things like this is the process of actually making them. It takes a lot, a mm. lot of time to um, to um, to make these boards. I mean, the pick and place wheel not so much because it's just the it's just the PCB. I need to um, I need to get assembled. But the arms filter is a lot more complicated because mm. um, the, um, for example, the mechanism, this mechanism that goes along with the with the dial, um, it, it takes about at least thirty minutes to to assemble this to, you know, to the standard I can get it shipped. So, um, well, I guess what I've been trying to do is just to streamline my process and just make it a bit more efficient. So um, I have things like. Um, like this um, custom test that I made, so I oh, use this to test. Yeah, nice. so I use this to test um, all the functions on the on the dial. So this has all the connections, just oh, as yeah. yeah, just as you find them in the sorry, just yeah. as you find them in the actual dial itself. So I made the connections here, so I can test um, each PCB um, exactly the way I can test all the functionalities of all of the board boards and make mm -hmm. sure. Um, everything works as it should before um, I actually ship them out. So this um, saves me a lot of time. And then um, I used to um, I used to make my boards with um, with an alt hair gun, but that was um, I I used to lose a lot of components um, mm. during that process. So recently, so I I built um, an alt hair plate, um, an alt hair reflow um, alt plate. So mm. um, yeah, so that's something I did recently just to make sure just to help me along with the process. So um, a lot of my efforts recently I was, I've, I've been towards you know improving the process in which i used to you know get this product out there so you mentioned that you lost a lot of components with the hot air reflow i'm wondering if you had the same problem that i have had where it just like if you put the air on it the wrong direction then it kind of like blows it off of the board and goes oh yeah, yeah 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 Was yeah, that yeah. The problem, i mean or? um no no not really no. mostly the components <laughs> i lose i mean I, I do have that problem but um i think oh. the fix for the fix idea for that was um, my reflow, uh, my reflow, um, my hot air gun, sorry, has this dial on it that you can use to turn um, the um. the air pressure. So I just turn it down when I uh, to start with. So when I get it to the point where the, um, the solder paste is starting to, um, I don't know, I don't, I'm not sure what the term to, to use, melt? but yeah, to melt. And I and I just um, I just turn and then I turn the um, pressure up a little bit, and ah. then that way I don't get components flying everywhere. I, I need work to get with one of those very tiny just... components, yeah, yeah, very tiny components, as small as 0402 on this, um, on the main board for this, um, for the Amstel down. So, um, the components I mostly lost were LEDs, um, LED, um, does the addressable LEDs on the oh. um, on the board. So, those those LEDs don't like, um, they don't like it at all. So, and those are some of the I more was... expensive components on the board, probably. No, I mean, not really, not really, though, no, no. no. okay, yeah, not really, um. Yeah. 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 They're, they're, those are those are more uh, much more expensive and difficult Makes to get, sense. considering um, the the cheap global chip shortage. Yeah, and I've heard that USB connectors can be expensive and hard to get as well. Yeah. Yeah. A little. A little I mean, I I source my components from um, from China, so I think I have um, um, compared to other other sources. I, mean, I think it's a bit um, it's a bit cheaper for me since I mm. source from. Um, I buy most oh, yeah. of them from lcsc.com. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and can you tell us what uh, are the chips that you're using on here? What's the microcontroller? Have you it, have you like chosen one for the first Almsville dial and kind of stuck with that, or have you moved to a different platform? Oh yeah, there? um, yeah, that was one of the upgrades I um I did mm. for um for the newer version. So the first version um required um the Atmega 32 U4. That's um the old um no not really I won't, I won't really call it old but that was like the original board that a lot of people used for hid based um devices back then mm. yeah so that was what i used for the first version of the amsterdam um, and then for the new um amsterdam v2 i used um the sam d21g um mm. 18 that's the um 
um, the same chip as the Arduino Zero boards. So that's mm -hmm. um, that's much faster. Yeah, it's much faster and uh, it just has a lot more um, a lot more pins for me to work with. And yeah, so that's what I use for um, the new drive. Yeah, it's the second time that you've mentioned doing sort of a speed update. So part of it was when you're talking about doing the rotary encoding, uh, and yeah. you chose a new method that would uh, speed up your process. And here also you've made the SAMD21 chip replace the Atmega 32U4, so that's faster as well. Anything else that uh, you've done to sort of make everything speed up and go faster and be more responsive and stuff? Yeah, um, I mean, um, the the um, if, you, if you take a look at the board um, on the side there, that's close to where you have, maybe not too visible, but on the, on the side where you have the linear rotary encoder. So um, you, you find two, um, analog comparators. So instead of having to um, do analog reading every, um, on every loop, so mm -hmm. like I said, um, part of the new functions I developed for the rotary encoder was um, is um, interrupt-based detection. So I use interrupts for rotary encoders. And considering I have um, two rotary encoders on the um, taller, on the taller dials, so mm -hmm. it was important to make sure um, that process was as efficient as possible. So I used interrupts instead of Having to, or you still have to read um, the um, analog readings from the sensors, but you only do that when you get an interrupt from the rotary encoder. So when you rotate yeah. it, there's an interrupt that's fired in the um, in the SAMD twenty one G. So, and then I respond to that interrupt by um, detecting the, um, the rotation that has occurred. Mm. There's so many cool videos on here. I'm curious what you would recommend for people who are new to your projects. Um, you know, there's there's so many different upgrades and interesting things that you've learned and that you're sharing on your in your tutorials and on your channel. What's one of the most interesting things that you think, or one of these videos that has really interesting, weird thing that you noticed that you don't think you see a lot of people talking about? Um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Uh, it's a weird question. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're asking me to pick a favorite. I, I mean. Okay, yeah, I mean, um, the the mini guacamole was was fun to make. It's super cute. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just just um, um, a weird project. That I, yeah, you know, um, when I was still um, uh, making uh, little videos, I just um, made anything I could. You know, I could um, couple up together. Just just combine different little parts that I had <laughs> on hand, and I made. Uh, yeah, so that's a bit. Uh, that was that was fun. Um, I did. Um, um, I did. Um, I did a coil. I used um, electro um, solenoid. Sorry, um, uh -huh. to yeah to make the moles <laughs> pop up and and down. So it was, it was a fun. Uh, it's um, I mean it's a fun video if if um, if you can get past the um, the dismal <laughs> quality of the video, then um, uh, it was a fun video to make. Oh, this is really interesting. Like you're you're diagramming out what the different components do and everything. This is so cool. Yeah, yeah. Just trying to explain um, how that's supposed to work. Yeah. This is beautiful. And then you have all these animations. All of your tutorials also have all these beautiful computer animations. So anyone who, yeah. you know, if you have trouble understanding things when people just describe them, uh, there's all this visual information that you've included, which is great. Uh, ah, this is so cool. I just have to admire it for a second, sorry. <laughs> okay, and then also you have this 3D printed yo-yo. So it's not all work, you know, you do make tools for people to build serious electronics, but you also make like this 3D printed yo-yo and things. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, um, this was when I this was when I was just, you know, um, um, getting into 3D printing. So the yo-yo was something that was you know, fun to, you know, to design and make um, completely out of um, 3D printed parts. So, and I think this was what's actually, um, um, what pushed me to to develop the um, a three D printed ball bearing? So I wanted oh. um, something tiny, yeah, instead of having to buy that. But although I didn't, I didn't use um, um, ball bearing in this um, this particular three D printed yo yo ball. Right after this, I developed the, um, I designed the um, the ball bearing. It's like yeah. a ring bearing. Cool. Did you do you put any kind of weights in here to make it spin better, or is it all just? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, I think there's somewhere in the video where I um, took okay, it. Maybe this um, animation will show that. But um, I have um, knots in on the rings of the of the yo-yo, so that just gives a lot more um, um, a lot more centrifugal force. So cool. Yeah. yeah. So it spins oh, there we go. Yeah. Oh, there's like special yo-yo weights. 
This is no, um, yeah, I mean, if you if you take a look for that on the, the video, you can see where I, I placed the knots. Yeah, okay, so you can oh, see. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, so, right. Very yeah, nice. M six knots. So I have them browned, you know, just to give it a bit, give it a bit of weight. Cool. Well, I'm going to watch through this whole thing. This is so fascinating. Okay. Uh, now I I know that I have to work for the rest of the day. And I'm so sad because I just want to watch the rest of your channel. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but for everyone else who's having similar feelings, um, we're coming to the end of our interview here. But you can always find more cool stuff uh, at your Twitter page. This doesn't seem to be your most active platform. You do have... I mean, um, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the YouTube is more... Um... Is more active i mean as active as i've been able to get it but normally i'm um, i just i'm just at least for, for right now i'm i'm a bit i'm a, I'm a bit bad with social uh with social oh, media yeah. so yeah i'm just i'm just recently trying to you know trying to change that i'm trying to um, i'm trying to share more um of my process so oh, great. that's something Love you can um, you can look forward to do go follow on twitter then do go follow on youtube both linked below uh projects on hackster and you can buy Ahmed's uh, creations on Tindy, but yeah. all these different ones that you saw today, and maybe some other new ones coming up. We don't know. Uh, yeah, but maybe. If you do... What's up? But if you do release something new, definitely come back and tell us about it. Ah, yeah. Uh, this is thank so cool. You, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining me, and thank you everybody for watching. This has been such a pleasure. Absolute highlight of my week. We'll see you next week. Uh, catch you soon. Ciao. Yeah. Hack right. on. <laughs>